My father died abruptly on August 26, 1990. He had checked into Mount Sinai Hospital on the east side of Manhattan in the late afternoon. I thought he had a bad cold or a bronchitis. So did he. I remember he could hardly make it up the stairs of my walk-up a few days before for a holiday dinner. But his cardiologist, Dick Lasser, a close family friend, told me that afternoon at Mount Sinai that he was sick. Il est malade, Dick said with his still thick American accent. I didn't understand that. It made no sense to me. I couldn't grasp how you could be sick from your heart, how one's heart could be sick. But it sank in a few hours later when they rushed him into surgery. We were in the waiting room near the surgery. It felt like for hours. I couldn't stand it anymore. It was the middle of the night. The place was deserted. And finally, I went to the nurse's desk. I could tell my father was in the room behind. People were talking to each other in muffled voices. There seemed to be many doctors there. His heartbeat was flashing on the screen on the nurse's console and other vitals, patient, Harcourt, Edgar, Albert. Then all of a sudden, the sound of his heartbeat went monotone, and the line went flat, and all hell broke loose. The doctors started screaming back there as they tried to resuscitate him with their jumper cables, and someone yelled out that they were losing him. And all I could do was watch that flat line of the heartbeat that wasn't beating anymore. I felt I was in a bubble, in some kind of cocoon. The sound had become muffled. I couldn't keep my eyes off the screen. The nurse was telling me I had to go back to the waiting room, but I could not, not be there. I could hardly hear through the muffled sound in my ears. My father was gone. I don't remember much after that, except that it was a difficult time. I was scheduled to move to Montgomery, Alabama, right after the holidays, to work with Brian Stevenson, something which had never gone down very well with my father. He'd always hoped I would be a partner at Cravath, Cravath Swain, he would say. Not, not that he was. He was a partner at a small but reputable law firm in New York. But he had earned it very honestly, having escaped occupied France and arrived in New York in 1940 as a 13-year-old Jewish refugee having just lost his own father. He'd made it on his own and done well. Maybe that's what made Cravath even more important to him. Uh, it, was look, it looked like I was on my way, uh, uh, and he must have been so proud. Princeton University, Wall Street banking officer, that was actually my first working <laughs> title at Chemical Bank, I kid you not. Harvard Law School, prestigious federal clerkship on the Southern District of New York. He must have thought that Cravath was next. And he was shattered when, about six months into my prestigious federal clerkship, I decided to quit and apply for a fellowship to work at Steve Bright's nonprofit down in Atlanta, uh, which at the time was called the Southern Prisoners Defense Committee. The death penalty cases I'd seen the year before, when I was still a third-year law student, uh, and I had interned at the Southern Prisoners Defense Committee, were haunting me. I just couldn't let go of them. The first case I had worked on, the trial attorney had clocked in eight hours of pretrial investigation in a death penalty case. Eight hours total of prep time. The state psychologist who testified against our client had fal falsified all of his credentials and graduated from high school. I could go on and on about that case. It was my first uh, of what I would soon learn to be a typical death penalty defense. In another case, the prosecutor had had his secretary type up the names of the potential jurors into four lists. Strong, medium, weak, black. And then he struck, of course, all of the African American jurors who were on the black list. Another man I had met on Alabama's death row was innocent. Uh, I just knew it uh, from meeting him. And I was a New Yorker. I don't trust people. I, I, I don't consider myself gullible. But when I came out of that interview with Walter McMillan off of Holman's death row, I knew he was innocent. The cases felt absolutely desperate. 
All of them seemed like travesties of justice. The lawyers there were fighting brush fires one after the other. Steve Bright, Ruth Friedman, Brian Stevenson, Clive Stafford Smith. I'd continued to work with Brian on cases after that January term, helping out from Cambridge and then late at night from New York on a few direct appeals to the Alabama courts. I remember Brian had to file one over the Easter break, and he flew me down to Montgomery to help draft the brief, allowing me, a young attorney just out of law school, to write up some of the claims. It felt so pressing and so urgent, and it was. There was nobody there but Brian at the small shoestring office that he just opened in Montgomery, except Eva Ansley, if I recall, who, who was uh, running the place as well. It felt desperate in Montgomery. When I left on that puddle jumper from the two-strip tarmac at Montgomery Airport, Montgomery International Airport, I just felt that I, I had to go back. I had to help. Little did I know, though, that you couldn't apply for a Skadden Fellowship if you were neither in law school nor in a clerkship, and so I just quit my clerkship, and I'd already lost the first job I'd ever gotten. But fortunately, George Kendall, Dick Burr, Steve Hawkins at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund helped work out a solution. I'd have an office at LDF till the end of December 1990, and then I'd work on Alabama cases with Brian and get partially compensated, and then ultimately move to Montgomery as soon as it was feasible. The plan worked out well. I was assigned three death cases. One was a direct appeal out of Mobile with a brief drew at the, due at the Alabama Court of Criminal Appeals. Uh, one was in federal habeas court, or at least needed to be filed. Uh, Kenny Magwood, he passed away of natural causes a couple of years later. And then there was one that needed to go into state habeas. Uh, what's called Rule 32 in Alabama, in Cullman County, uh, and that was Doyle Lee Han. I'd just come from a district court up north, and I thought I knew how to litigate a habeas case, uh, so that was good. My office was right next to the director counsels, uh, the imposing Julius Chambers, and I happily began to spend my late nights down on 99 Hudson Street only a few blocks away from the federal courthouse on Foley Square that I had just left. Everything was working out. I was finally doing what mattered, what I could offer. I felt I was where I was needed. I'd soon moved to Montgomery. My family in New York was pretty distraught from the death of my father, but I couldn't not, not be in Alabama, where I felt I was truly and desperately needed. I could not not lend a hand to Doyle Ham and Kenny and the other men and women awaiting executions. Doyle Ham was pretty quiet uh, when I first met him in 1991. He'd been on death row since September 1987, and he'd already gone very quickly through his direct appeals to the Alabama Court of Criminal Appeals and the Alabama Supreme Court and the United States Supreme Court. He'd been convicted of a robbery murder that resulted in the death of Patrick Cunningham, uh, uh, who was working as a night clerk at a motel in Coleman County, Alabama, a rural county just outside of Birmingham. Two individuals were initially found in a car that had been used to commit the crime, Regina Roden and Douglas Roden. They claimed that they'd been kidnapped by Doyle Ham and held in captivity at gunpoint. But after some time in detention in the jail, Regina and Douglas Roden changed their story, told the police that they were the unwitting accomplices of Doyle Ham, who they identified as the trigger man. They would both testify against Doyle in exchange for lenience. And what was clear from the evidence was that three people went to the motel that night and a robbery occurred. What was less clear was who the trigger person was. After Doug and Regina Roden agreed to testify against Doyle, though, everything went downhill for him. Joel's case was assigned to an attorney who had just left the prosecutor's office. Um, as you may know, there's no, federal def there's no, there's no state defender system uh, in the state of Alabama. There's no system to provide representation for indigent defendants. Cases are assigned to a local attorney, uh, often with no capital experience. And the compensation at the time was capped at $1,000. So you'd get the case, you get $1,000 
and that would be it. All of the lawyering would be capped at $1,000, which is probably not enough to even keep the lights on at night if you spent the improper amount of time working on a death penalty case. But most of the appointed lawyers didn't, and Doyle's attorney wasn't any exception. The penalty phase mitigation evidence that he presented lasted 19 minutes. Uh, his, his jury penalty phase began on September 28, 1987 at 11.15 a.m. in the morning. This was a full trial, so it starts at 11.15 with opening statements to the jury, presentation of evidence, closing statements, instruction, and a jury determination. The attorney put on 19 minutes of evidence. He put on two witnesses. The first was Ruthie Murphy, Dole's sister, who in kind of monosyllabic yes sirs and no sir answers essentially gave very little evidence. No educational problems, she said. The clincher for her was the fact that she wouldn't mind seeing him executed if it could bring back Patrick Cunningham. Quite a, quite a way to quite a way to convince a jury. The other witness was a one and a half page, and these pages are actually very, uh, there's very little testimony on any of these pages. One and a half pages by the deputy sheriff, uh, Johnson, uh, who basically said one line that he was cooperative. And that was it. Trial counsel didn't call mental health experts or introduce any of the documentation, any document, no document. At all. And the same day, after a lengthy lunch, the jury returned a verdict of death at 4.30 p.m. by a vote of 11 to 1. That's enough in Alabama. You don't need to have a unanimous jury verdict of death. Of course, you don't even need, at the time, you didn't even need a jury verdict of death because you could have a jury life verdict and the judge could sentence the person to death anyway. All told, the death sentencing trial which was where all of his ev mitigation evidence would have come in, lasted less than four hours. Jury ne never heard anything about his life, his disadvantages, mitigation that might have really led someone to spare his life. And that's where my work would start in his case, tracking down all the records and the witnesses to get to paste together a life, a life that was never presented to the jury. You see, Doyle had been raised uh, in a very poor part of Alabama, in a very poor family in Alabama, um, the grandchild of sharecroppers who could barely keep the family fed during hard times. His grandfather, Riley B. Ham, was a tough man. His father, Major Edward Ham, was even tougher. Major Ham, and that was his name, that wasn't his rank. Uh, came back from his military service here in Europe uh, during World War II with a debilitating alcohol addiction and a knack for slapping his boys around, all eight of them. Now, the boys and the two girls were raised uh, in poverty. Uh, his mother, and sometimes when his father was capable, would work the fields. And his father was basically in and out of jail uh, for disorderly conduct, intoxication, assault, um, Major Ham would tell his sons, all eight of them, that if you don't steal, you're not a ham. Perhaps, not surprisingly, they all got in trouble. All eight boys would end up in the plantation penitentiaries of Alabama and Mississippi. They'd all do major time. This is a slide from the pre-sentence report that was given to the judge at the sentencing hearing by the probation and parole unit. And these are the the brothers. There's uh, James Ham, he served time in prison. Roy Ham, he served time in prison. Horace Ham, he's a parchment. That's the plantation penitentiary in Mississippi. There's Jimmy Ham, he's at the parchment prison in Mississippi. There's O'Neill, he's at the parchment prison in Mississippi. There's David Ham, who served a lot of time in uh, Alabama, and Danny Ham, the youngest of them all, who's also at parchment prison. When they would take a family portrait, it was in the penitentiary. Major Ham had raised his boys well. 
It was the Ham Gang, kind of like the Daltons. Doa was one of the younger boys, and, uh, and he was a cute kid. Um, but he had a hard time with his health, especially his mental health, his schooling, and his cognitive abilities. There'd been some concern when he was born. At least that's what I had heard from the siblings that I could track down. I did find some evidence from his mother's delivery records that when he was a baby, he actually was tongue-tied. They weren't sure uh, what was going on. But pretty quickly in school, it became clear that there were some deeper issues, never diagnosed. Um, he essentially flunked uh, arithmetic, reading, spelling. He'd repeat his first grade. He would ultimately get socially promoted, earning pretty much uh, D's and F's. And no one ever really checked or diagnosed anything. By fifth grade, uh, he was reading at the first grade level, essentially. He'd drop out of school pretty soon. And when I had him tested, he consistently placed in the first percentile, which is the lowest possible measure for reading, writing, and arithmetic. Dole suffered extensive head injuries when he was a child. He abused all kinds of intoxicating agents, mostly glue and gas when he was a kid, later all kinds of hard drugs. And he began having seizures, again, which were essentially undiagnosed. For some years, he was on anti-seizure medication. Eventually, his medical records would indicate that he had epilepsy or a seizure disorder. When I had him diagnosed properly, Dr. Dill Watson would identify lateral brain damage and essentially borderline mental retardation. Dr. Watson concluded that Dole had and still suffers from neuropsychological impairment and presumptive brain damage, as well as other deficits, which in his words, had a significant impact on his daily functioning. His history of mental impairments would have been key to linking, of course, his difficult childhood and his poor upbringing with his impaired judgment and his influenceability, both of which would have been important to assess his true culpability, his responsibility, his comparative responsibility as against Douglas and Regina Roden. Now, Doyle didn't escape the fate of his brothers. And uh, he spent most of the 1970s and the 1980s in penitentiaries in Mississippi, Alabama, Tennessee. Uh, by the time of his drug-induced spree in 1987, about the time that I would meet him a few years before, he, like his brother, was a solid convict. He'd never had a chance. Now, by the end of my investigation, I had accumulated about five banker's boxes filled with documents from his birth records, educational records. I have all kinds of records uh, to present to the state court in habeas corpus. They represented a, a wealth of documents that had never been presented before in mitigation, lengthy interviews with neighborhoods who'd seen the ham boys grow and who'd lived with them, lengthy criminal records of his father, and the other boys, school, medical, mental health records that documented his cognitive deficiencies and his histories of seizures, head injuries, drug and alcohol abuse, all of which had never been presented or investigated. The records showing that Doyle had a history of chronic seizure were there, testimony from a social worker, gay niece, who prepared an extensive chronology of the head injuries and of his upbringing, all tied together uh, with the mental health records. None of that had been presented, none of it included in the penalty phase, none of the story, a story which really kind of reads like a case out of, you know, Walker Evans' Let Us Now Praise Famous Men, right? Rural Alabama and Mississippi, poverty of the worst kind, alcoholic father, destitute family, eight boys, all ending up in the plantation penitentiary. Doyle was destined for death row. But all of that would be for naught. After the state habeas corpus hearing, the Alabama Attorney General, so this is the head prosecutor for the state of Alabama, this is the, this is the opposing counsel, this is, the, this is the party that's trying to uh, still today execute Doyle, drafted an 89-page document arguing against all of our evidence and all of our legal claims in excruciating detail. 
In 89 pages of argument, the Alabama prosecutor made factual claims that devastated all of our evidence and arguments of law that decimated every legal foundation we could rely on. On their view, we were procedurally barred in practically all of our claims and meritless on the few that the court could ever consider. The prosecutor styled their legal brief as a proposed memorandum opinion. And they filed it on Friday afternoon, December 3, 1999, with the clerk of the Coleman County Court. So the prosecutor essentially styled its legal brief as a judicial opinion. And on Monday morning, December 6, 1999, as soon as the state judge, Don, Don Hardiman, came into the office, he signed the proposed opinion without making a single modification, without even striking the word proposed from his opinion. And since that time, since 1999, we've been litigating this case in state and federal courts that, of course, have all given great deference to the judicial opinion from the state court because, as a matter of law, under the AEDPA, passed by President Bill Clinton in, in the mid-1990s, all subsequent federal courts have to defer to this court's opinion on facts and law, to defer, in this case, of course, to the Alabama Attorney General. Never did anyone blink an eyelash. Never did a single judge, state or federal, district, appellate, or supreme, never did a single judge or justice ever question this miscarriage of justice. Never did Doyle ever receive a fair shot at the determination of the facts and the law. At one point, uh, uh, over the next 18 years, I thought there was a glimmer of hope. Uh, I was arguing Doyle Ham's federal habeas appeal at the 11th Circuit in Atlanta, Georgia, at the Court of Appeals. Uh, it was November 2014, and one of the three judges on the panel started to get somewhat agitated about this. Uh, his name was Judge Adalberto Jordan. And during the Alabama Attorney General's time at the podium, Judge Jordan started to lay into him, her, uh, Beth Jackson Hughes. Isn't it, isn't it a bit odd, isn't it, that the Alabama Rule 32 judge takes the state's proposed findings and conclusions, 89 pages worth, and files them as the judge's own within a day of receiving them without even taking the time to take out the word proposed? Doesn't that engender, that doesn't engender much confidence in the Alabama state court system, right? That can't make anybody feel good about the system, can it? You'd be up in arms, wouldn't you, if he, if that judge had taken Mr. Ham's proposed findings and conclusions with the word proposed and filed them in the court the next day, you'd be up in arms, right? This is almost 90 pages worth of stuff. It's detailed. It's detailed, he says. And I'm telling you, I know what AEDPA deference is. And I know what we're supposed to do with regards to state court findings. I'm telling you that it sticks in my craw. And I don't believe it for a second. I know what ADPA deference requires me to do, and I don't speak for my colleagues, but I'm telling you, I don't believe for a second that that judge went through, through, through 89 pages in a day and then filed that as his own, as if he had gone through everything, went through his notes, the transcript, the exhibit, and the like. It just can't be done. It just can't be done. That's just a comment. It turns out, sadly, that that was just a comment. Uh, in its decision affirming the denial of habeas corpus, a few months later, the 11th Circuit uh, brushed the problem aside. It ended up being a little short footnote, calling it a mere, quote, procedural shortcut that had no bearing on our disposition of Ham's federal habeas appeal, he said. And then he cited to one of that court's previous decisions that required deference to these kinds of opinions. Last December, I brought this and several other perhaps even more troubling errors to the attention of the United States Supreme Court, but to no avail. Uh, without even a single dissenting voice, Doyle was sent on his way down the road to death. At this point, to be brutally honest, uh, Doyle and I have only two things going for us right now. The first is that there are about 21, actually uh, there was an execution last week, so it's 20, uh, 
about 20 guys ahead of us. 20 guys who kind of came out of the chute before we did. So if everything goes as usual, they would need to seek execution warrants against those 20 inmates first, and that would be a lot of litigation. So it could take some time. The second thing going for us uh, is that nature might beat the state. Uh, Doyle has cancer. Uh, it started with a large mass behind his right eye. Uh, and uh, doctors in Birmingham had gotten rid of that with some radiation. Last month they did some invasive surgery, but I fear that the cancer has metastasized. And uh, he had until recently two kind of golf ball size growths, one on the side and one on his stomach. Um, although he called me last night and told me that they'd gone away. He'd been praying and he says that they've gone away. But uh, I fear that the cancer has spread pretty much throughout his body. Um, and recently, in talking about uh, the situation with Didier Fassin, who's a friend and a colleague at the Institute for Advanced Study, Didier raised the possibility that a lethal injection could be the best way to end a painful struggle against terminal cancer. And Didier was a doctor before becoming the extraordinary anthropologist that he is. As you know, he's written extensively and critically on the rationality of humanitarianism. I hadn't really thought of that possibility. Um, but I suppose there would be something poetic about it. In the end, when the time comes, the state of Alabama, which of course is a law against assisted suicide and helping people kind of end their lives, might actually help Doyle in the case. I'm not entirely sure, though, whether Doyle will last long enough to transform his death, death sentence into a form of euthanasia, or alternatively, whether we'll be able to keep the state at bay long enough. It's been now 30 years. Supreme Court's shown no interest. Uh, there were more egregious claims that I presented. I assure you, I, did, I didn't have time to go into it in the short time that we have today. His prior criminal record in Tennessee, which was used as his aggravating circumstance, was actually facially invalid and substantively true, uh, substantively too, and, um, but no one's ever really looked at that. I spent six years litigating that one in Tennessee because it was a prior conviction from Tennessee. I tracked down the facially defective 2,000-word plea hearing that he had had in 1978, um, but, but no one really cares. The jury improperly heard that he'd been convicted of armed robbery before, uh, which was not the case. So there were lots of other errors, but to no avail. Um, the long and short of it is that we've been able to stretch his sentence of death out for several decades now, fighting uh, in a range of state and federal courts uh, since 1990, 27 years, uh, sometimes within the bounds and sometimes slightly outside. And it's starting to feel now as if Dole Ham is sentenced to something a little bit different, maybe pa parallel or strangely reminiscent of something not exactly approximating death, but close, perhaps even closer to a life awaiting death. It's a different regime that Doyle has been subjected to in the United States, a form of regimented solitary confinement. As you know, the Soaring decision, uh, which prohibits lengthy detentions on death row, um, exceeding five years, as a matter of international law, doesn't apply in the United States. Uh, so there's none of that for us. Instead, what we've seen develop is this kind of lengthy, lifelong form of punishment, a daily routine that goes on day in and day out, a form of waiting death. There's no rehabilitation, naturally, and no disciplining either, really. Uh, it's just timetables, timetables for their own sake, warehousing, a measured, tedious, lifelong awaiting. You'll recall that other scene with which Foucault opened Discipline and Punishment. Not the excruciating and brutal scene of the quartering and burning of Denia, the regicide, but that numbing list of the schedules at a juvenile facility around 1840. Article 17. Five in the summer, they'll work for nine hours a day throughout the year. 
rising at the first drum roll they'll rise and dress in silence second drum roll they'll dress and make their beds third they'll line up and proceed to the chapel for morning prayer there's a five minute interval between each drum roll works meals school at four o'clock prisoners leave their workshop and go into the courtyards where they wash their hands and form into divisions of the refractory for a quarter of an hour one of the prisoners or supervisors reads a passage from some instructive or uplifting work this is followed There's a similar regimen for Dole Hand, but it has no work, no school, no prayers. It has no instructive or uplifting work. It's just an early rise, a confinement in the cell, a meal plate, more confinement, another meal plate, confinement. And lights out over and over and over every day. How can we think of this kind of punishment? How would we? How would we describe this? They, there's no, there's no, it's, there isn't a, it isn't a form of discipline, though it is, of course, discipline. Um, it works on the body. It numbs the mind. It's kind of a holding pattern, physical, a physical holding with cycles of solitude when he's confined to his cell or collective solitude watching TV in the pod. It's some other kind of punishment, really. Is it bare life? Perhaps. Agamben's concept of bare existence might capture the dimensions of dehumanization and degradation that characterize Dole's 27 years on death row. He's been reduced effectively to nothing more than bare animal existence, satisfying his caloric intake. That's about it. All of his humanity has been stamped out, annihilated, He's no longer a full human being, but a thing that lives, waiting to be put to death. Perhaps that's what it is, 27 years of bare life. Now, from a human rights perspective or a domestic US civil and political rights perspective, this punishment of bare life should unquestionably violate the founding principles of human dignity. And from a normative, but also from a utilitarian perspective, this punishment of bare life could only be considered unjust and not useful. The remarkable work of Professor Roger Hood, one of the world's preeminent death penalty scholars and perhaps more importantly, moral exemplar in his lifelong dedication to the abolition of the death penalty worldwide. Roger, Roger Hood's remarkable work would make this clear, as does the equally trenchant work of Professor Carolyn Hood, also a preeminent death penalty scholar and co-author Roger Hood, the better article treatise, the foremost authority of the death penalty in the international context, the death penalty, which I believe is in its recognition. So, Roger Hood and Carolyn Boyle's exemplary writings would ask us to look straight at the death penalty as a problem in practice, asking us to consider whether it can ever be fairly and whether it might ever be usefully applied. And, and what they, they conclude is that today, in their words, Capital punishment is more rarely enforced than it is threatened, and furthermore, that the trend in most retention states has been to employ executions less and less frequently. Capital punishment, they show us, is a slowly dying institution. Now, that seems right, or that, that seems right even in the United States. Uh, we've seen a consistent decline in the capital execution numbers uh, since the beginning of the millennium. Uh, and this is true both for convictions uh, and for executions. These here are the executions. In an article titled Staying Optimistic, Professor Hood remains confident that a, well, it was written before some of the more recent political events, um, but uh, he remained confident that a universal appeal to human rights uh, and might convince retentionist states to do away with the death penalty. And I, too, remain optimistic, although I think, as we all recognize, we just suffered a little bit of a setback in the United States, and perhaps you, too, uh, in England. Um, we came close to getting rid of the death penalty in the United States, uh, re really close. <laughs> uh, it was almost a done deal. Hillary Clinton would be elected president of the United States, and with one or two new justices replacing the conservative justices, we would have had a majority to abolish the death penalty. 
Carol Steicher and Jordan Steicher had mapped out the judicial strategy in their new book, Courting Death, which appeared just a few weeks before the election. And it was just a matter of time before the United States Supreme Court would rule that the evolving standards of decency had, well, evolved. Uh, each year, another state abolished the death penalty. Um, we no longer execute juveniles. We no longer execute persons with mental retardation. The problems of innocence and of lethal injection uh, had had their toll on the American desire to punish. And we would join the ranks of the rest of civilized societies, placing ourselves next to England, France, Europe, no longer with China, North Korea, and authoritarian regimes. We were almost there. Uh, but instead, by some fluke that uh, no one predicted, especially not the political scientists, Donald Trump took the Electoral College and his Supreme Court nominations are likely to cast a 30-year shadow over the federal judiciary. Uh, with Justice Neil Gorsuch, who's aged 49, in the place of Antonin Scalia, any possible retirements or worse, deaths um, on, on, the, on the liberal side will inextricably turn the court to a 5-4 conservative majority for decades to come. Uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, a remarkable and just woman, uh, is over 84 years old. Uh, Justice Anthony Kennedy, who's still the swing vote right now, so he's really the fifth vote right now, um, is going to celebrate his uh, 81st birthday in July. Justice Steve Breyer, another just man, is 79. Um, or will be 79 in August. Should any of those seats become vacancies in the next three and a half years, the tide will turn for decades to come, at least three decades. So things have changed recently in the United States, which was certainly not predictable, and of course, which will mean a lot more work for each and every one of us. But I'll have to confess that I never really approached the death penalty from this human rights or civil rights perspective, nor from a utilitarian, nor from a liberal normative perspective. In fact, I never approached it from an abolitionist perspective, and I've never called myself an abolitionist to this day. I've never lectured about the death penalty, <laughs> believe it or not. I've never made it a focus of my scholarship. My scholarship has all, always been about other things than capital punishment. Uh, I only wrote two short articles, uh, one about the South African Supreme Court decision, which was so remarkable in the 1990s, and another forced by Austin Surratt to predict abolition, which I did in 2050. But instinctively, I've always felt, I've always known that it would not make sense for me to research or theorize the death penalty. I litigate the death penalty, yes, for almost three decades now, but I've never before agreed to talk about it. As a critical theorist and thinker, you see, it's always frightened me to dig into the topic for good cause. As some of you may notice writing this lecture has kind of thrown me into a bit of an existential crisis. But it has forced me to confront some fundamental contradictions in my own life. Uh, the fact is, I've, what I've done, the work I've done on behalf of Doyle and others really does not cohere with the rest of my world view. And I know you might find that odd uh, you may think that critical theory would nourish my struggle for Doyle or others. You might think it's because I'm a critical theorist that I do what I do. But it's actually the exact opposite. My lawyering, if anything, is a double-edged sword that very possibly may do more to legitimize the current capital system in the United States than it does to undermine it. The law can play that role, particularly in a country like the United States with its long history of slavery and lynchings and its long and ugly history with the death penalty. Indeed, it was Carol Steiker and Jordan Steiker many years ago in an earlier iteration uh, in a piece called Sober Second Thoughts 
1995 that had laid out this somewhat kind of counterintuitive argument, but a compelling argument, at least to me. The purported failures of the death penalty were actually what were making it last in the United States. All of our procedural struggles, all of this ongoing litigation, was actually legitimating the death penalty in the United States. So taking a, a different leaf out of Foucault's Discipline and Punish and drawing more explicitly from Max Weber and Antonio Gramsci, Carol and Jordan Steicher argued that the failures of the Eighth Amendment jurisprudence could not be thought as failures, but had to be analyzed in terms of their productive effects. Just as Foucault had refused to stop at the failures of the prison and instead to force us to see the productive effects of those failures, in his case, the production of docile bodies, the production of the category of the delinquent as a means to distribute punishment, of the accumulation of men necessary for the accumulation of capital, well, the Stikers had turned our attention to the productive effects of Eighth Amendment dysfunctionality. The death penalty, they had argued, was both over and under-regulated. It was over-regulated because there was so much jurisprudence, so many technicalities that had no effect, all of the rules about the AEDPA, procedural default, etc. But it was also under-regulated because the courts never really looked at the merits of the cases, as you saw in Dole's case. And the result was layer upon layers of proceduralism without any substantive review. And on their view, the Eighth Amendment jurisprudence was both too messy and too meaningless, but these failures, they suggested, served another function to legitimize the death penalty in the larger criminal justice system in American eyes. And they asked us to rethink the functionality of the law. They said, you know, you can't, they say, you can't know what a thing uh, is that a thing is not doing well until you know what it is that it's supposed to be doing. And of course, it turned out on their view that it was actually doing something well, namely letting the system survive. Now, this analysis, very similar, for instance, to Douglas Hayes' analysis about the legitimating functions of clemency uh, in uh, 19th century England, of Foucault on the productive functions of the prison, of Gramsci on the hegemonic functions of ideology. Their analysis had always struck me and stuck with me as right. In more ordinary terms, it was the problem of becoming a cog in the system, right? a cog instead of a wrench, of becoming a part of the death system, of helping it allow to function properly. At a critical level, I also always wondered how much more could be done to transform the world into a better place where many more young people could avoid Dole's poverty and upbringing, and how much more that might help improve the world and render society more just. I always feared thinking critically about the amount of time of years it took me to try and save one life when so many others we're going through similar childhoods and upbringings with no one lending them a hand. Wouldn't we be better, better off investing in education than in prisons? Hmm? And despite that, I dedicated a, a part of a lifetime to keeping one or two prison, one or two people from the butcher, from delaying a couple of executions, or producing sentences of life imprisonment without parole, lives that are hardly worth living. But faced with a life at risk, I always put aside critical thought. I didn't allow myself to think. I didn't allow myself to ask these questions. I'd thought of giving up, in Dole's case, I thought at times of handing off his case to somebody else I would have wanted to, particularly when we had young kids and lived in Arizona, literally on the other end of the continent. I even said I would. I told the judge I was going to, but I never did. I never could. I couldn't leave Doyle. I, now, I, I couldn't leave Doyle to his fate because at least I believed, and still somewhat believe, that Dole needed me. 
Not that I was qualified. I wasn't when I took his case. I was one year out of law school. It was somewhat preposterous. It was somewhat crazy of me to take his case. I had no experience. There was no reason to place his life in my hands. But there wasn't anybody else. I couldn't sell his case. We tried. Brian and I, we went up to New York. We went to the fancy Wall Street law firms, and we would try to get them to take this case. But, but Dole's case, they would take cases once in a while, but Dole's case just wasn't, it wasn't a sexy death penalty case. You know, nobody really wanted his case. There wasn't, there wasn't, uh, there wasn't innocence. There wasn't, uh, there wasn't blatant racial discrimination. I mean, the discrimination that was there was on the victim side, not on the, on the, on the defendant side. There wasn't... Uh, profound mental retardation. There was nothing that we couldn't get anybody to take the case. That's how, that's how I always ended up with my cases, because we couldn't find anyone else to take it. Doyle needed me. Now, I realize that might sound somewhat presumptuous. Doyle needed me. Or Doyle needs me. I mean, it's a little bit arrogant or inconsiderate. And as I've thought about it more and more, I've realized that it's, it's probably the other way around. The exact opposite. It turns out it's I who needed Doyle, and still do. I need Doyle to put my soul to rest, because in the end, I don't know how any of us, especially any of us who are lawyers, but any of us as humans, how any of us could not give a part of ourselves to help another. How can anyone live if they're not giving something to someone else? And the resulting paradox, which I really think is a paradox, is that by means of Doyle, I've been kind of interpolated into being a liberal subject rather than a critical theorist. Individual life and the framework of rights, it turns out, has such traction on us all, on me at least, to save Doyle's life that it kind of captures and absorbs me in a way. And soon shapes my own subjectivity. I have no choice but to argue for due process and for Doyle's constitutional rights. Precisely because life is so valuable or incommensurate. Precisely for the reasons that Kant spoke about the inviolability of life, the ethical obligation to never treat life instrumentally and therefore to kill a murderer. Imagine that. For that very reason, precisely because life is incommensurate, it can't be treated instrumentally. I can't, out, I can't cost out Dole's life. I can't, I, can't, I can't trade his life for better education for someone else. And it all happened by coincidence. It was an accident, an event. Um, it, was a, it was actually, for me, a speaker at law school, Joe Nursey, uh, from Team Defense. He came up from Atlanta. And he, he talked to us a little bit about his cases. It was a visit to death row in Alabama. It was Walter McMillan, an innocent man, or Dole Ham, who had nothing going for him. It was a decision that I, that I made. Perhaps it was an ethical choice. I'm not sure. I think it was a, a decision that was en situation, as Jean-Paul Sartre would say, and one that carried with it certain consequences. Nothing more. An ethical choice I made, and one that I've stuck with, and that I stick by. Now, in his seminars on the death penalty during the year 1999-2000, Jacques Derrida explored, among other things, four historically important and world historic executions. Socrates, Jesus Christ, Mansur al-Halaj, who was a Persian mystic uh, writer and teacher of Sufism who was executed in 922, and Joan of Arc. 
And Derrida suggested that they were all four killed for their claim to speak the truth for presenting themselves as the voice of God or for claiming that they heard God and for that reason that they were speaking some truth. I am truth, Jesus and Halaj literally said, Derrida emphasizes. I am the witness. I can witness a truth bigger than you or me. Now, um, it's, it's, it's a fascinating discussion and I think it's right. Um, for these exceptional men and women who have been in, executed in history. Um, and surely it's true for Socrates, uh, perhaps for Jesus. Uh, they did speak a truth that others didn't want to hear. They confronted their peers, the complacency, the established wisdom of their peers, and in that, they were threatening. They were destabilizing. They, they threatened the social hierarchy. They challenged the power structure. At the very least, they were utter nuisances and had bad influences on the young. Um, but it's less likely uh, that we would be killing parisiastic speech or killing truthful speech when we sentence to death the common criminal, the mundane, ordinary criminal in the United States or in China. Uh, there may on occasion be truth tellers, but I don't sense that that's what we were doing, at least not what we were doing in Dole's case. Now, it may be that we sentence the common criminal to death in order to kill the truth of our own weakness or our own corrupt human nature. Perhaps we kill because the criminal tells us the truth about ourselves, our twisted nature. And in killing the man convicted of homicide, we could be cleansing ourselves uh, of a truth about ourselves. I think truth also probably comes in at the other end. It's only the certainty of a truthful belief that allows us to execute someone. It's our self-righteousness, our utter faith in ourselves as knowers of right and wrong, of knowers of fact that allows us to kill another. But in the end, I think truth also comes in in another way. In the end, perhaps Doyle tells us something about ourselves. At least, perhaps Doyle uh, tells me something about myself, about my need for him, my need to help him, my need as someone in the legal, legal profession, but not only in the legal profession, also as a human being, to give part of myself to another in need. Or, despite all of my doubts and unspoken fears, that there is an ethical choice or an ethical decision that has to be taken untheorized, unthinkingly, without asking questions. Maybe this is a form of truth-telling, uh, of my own truth-telling. Or perhaps there's something in Doyle's life that reminds me of that time that I had to watch a heartbeat. Or the, or the fear I had and the sense of utter loss when the line went straight. Or the fear of having to face the loss, more generally, of a father, a mother, a daughter, a son, or a partner. It was always accompanying the children that hurt the most. Joy Tomlin was a charming young woman by the time uh, I had met her in the early 1990s. Um, she must have been only about two years old or so when her father, Phil Tomlin, uh, was arrested and charged with capital murder for the shooting death of Ricky Brune and his 15-year-old girlfriend, Cheryl Moore. Uh, it was a revenge killing, uh, the state believed, uh, and the evidence, though entirely circumstantial, was very strong. On the state's view, Philip had come back to his hometown of Mobile, Alabama, from Texas, where he lived and worked with his best friend, that is his hitman, to revenge the death of his younger brother, David Tomlin. Everyone knew that Ricky Brune had shot David, it was a shotgun blast in the stomach, and he was killed instantly, but uh, they were good friends, and Ricky claimed it was an accident. A local prosecutor believed Ricky, David's father didn't, and uh, he did everything he could to have Ricky Bruin charged, but to no avail. The state uh, wasn't going to take it uh, seriously, 
And so uh, Philip Tomlin's father, this is a picture of Philip many years later. Uh, he was 22 at the time that this happened. Um, he was accused of taking the matter into his own hands and, uh, and shooting Ricky and his girlfriend. He was put on death row in 1978. Now, when I got Phil Tomlin's case in 1990, which would have been 12 years later, he'd been retried once and sentenced to death again on a judicial override. Uh, and this was a judicial override from a unanimous 12 to 0 verdict for life from the jury. And um, judges could do that in Alabama. They could do that until 2017, actually. Um, and they, they could simply disregard the life verdict. And Philip Tomlin's judge was a particularly uh, a real character in Mobile, Judge Farrell McRae. He used to call me son in court. Mm. He had a reputation for overriding life sentences. He'd done it about five times, single-handedly putting people on death row. Of course, he made a big deal out of it, particularly during election times, um, because as you may know, uh, judges are elected in Alabama. They still are. And the death penalty was always a hot election topic. In any event, I got Philip Tomlin's case reversed on appeal for prosecutorial misconduct and then tried it again in 1993. Actually, tried it twice, tried, got it reversed again, tried it again uh, with Steve Bright in 1999. But uh, what I was coming to was Joy Tomlin, his daughter. Uh, she'd be about 18 uh, at his third trial in 1993, about 24, 25 at his trial in 1999. Uh, at that point, she was a mom. Now, she and her little brother, Chris, had visited their father at Holman, Pre Pe Holman Penitentiary every week growing up. So did his parents. They were a, a tight-knit family. Uh, and, and, and Philip Tomlin's young children were always there for him. They were really his lifeline. Um, his wife, they were very young when all of this happened. He, again, he was only 22, and his wife was a few years younger. His wife stuck with him for a while for the formalities, but, um, but then after that o would always bring the kids. Um, and now, still today, uh, his kids and his grand, grandchildren, uh, granddaughter, a little girl who just won Miss Rodeo uh, about a year ago, uh, are still his uh, pride and joy. Um, and I can remember it almost uh, as if it were today. Uh, we were in the sentencing in the year uh, 2000, um, Steve Bright and I, and uh, we put a hell of a mitigation case on. Uh, we had Don Cabana, who was the uh, commissioner of the Mississippi Department of Corrections, who came to testify on Philip Tomlin's behalf. And he had reviewed Philip Tomlin's full institutional jacket, and he was a, he was a, he was a big Mississippi commissioner of the Department of Corrections. Really big, with a beautiful accent. And he just was the best witness I've ever had. And he just talked about how Philip, Philip Tomlin was an ideal prisoner and had been on the row for 22 years. We put on the captain. Philip Tomlin had been... Uh, Elected representative, uh, he was a model prisoner for everyone. He'd always take the new guys on the row and kind of, you know, show them the ropes, um, calm them down. Uh, everybody testified he was the perfect prisoner. And uh, I remember being in that courtroom. We still had the unanimous jury verdict for life, uh, all of this mitigating evidence, the strongest mitigating case I'd ever shown, a new judge. McRae had retired uh, by 1999. Anyway, there we were again, and again, again, a judge was sentencing Philip Tomlin. You could, you could, the courtroom, when, when someone is uh, being sentenced to death, the courtroom is it's really quiet. You can hear a pin drop. It's really an austere moment. Utter silence. The moment the judge issued his sentence, without missing a heartbeat, Steve Bright, with his booming, haunting, resonating voice and his soft Kentucky accent, stands up and bellows out. He says, 
May God save your soul. Courtroom was really shaken. Death, God, they both just made their appearance in quick succession. And that's the kind of thing that doesn't fade away. They stuck there haunting the courtroom until everyone left. Until it was only joy left in the room. Sobbing, curled up on the wood bench, watching the marshals take her father away for a fourth time to his death. I thought I knew what it was like to lose a father. Of course, Joy had to lose hers over and over. I tried to console Joy. I hugged her, but she was pretty unconsolable. Of course, I, I, I understood. And her father was already on the way back to death row. Now, it wouldn't be until 2005 uh, that I would get Philip Tomlin off of the row once and for all. Um, that judge in 2000 uh, had uh, thankfully, uh, unthinkingly, said that he'd sentenced Philip Tomlin to death because his co-defendant, the alleged hitman, John Daniels, had been sentenced to death himself, and that would make no sense to give a lighter sentence to the person who instigated it all. And that, of course, that goes against the, that goes against the right to an individual determination of sentence. And, uh, and I was lucky enough to convince the Alabama Supreme, Supreme Court of that, but then I think they'd, they'd really had it with his case. Uh, they'd had it about four times, they'd reversed it four times, and finally they said, look, just sentence this man to life imprisonment without parole and be done with it. And from a, from a formal legal perspective, that makes no sense. They couldn't really do that. Uh, but they'd had it with this case. And they just wanted to be done with it. 27 years, four trials, even more sentencings and overrides. We'd ruined the good taste of death. He could go serve the rest of his natural life in prison. Feeling Joy's pain, her unconsolable pain, her body shaking, the judge having just condemned her father to a fatal lethal injection. No one should ever have to go through that. In the end, on my part, it was a simple, or rather simply, an ethical choice not an intellectual one, not a critical one, just a decision in situation. Something about the irreducibility of life or about human weakness or, or about the irrational or perhaps the fact that I've always placed myself in the situation of, a, of Doyle uh, or of Phil Tomlin. Instinctively, I don't know why, I've always just put myself in the shoes of the subjugated of the les soumis, of the young refugee fleeing, or of the pursued, of the death row inmate. En situation. I never really asked the question from the viewpoint or from the safety of critical thought, but from the point of view of the marginalized, of the infamous. La vie des hommes infâmes, the powerless, the mad, the delinquent, the disorderly, the profile, the targeted, the discriminated. And how could one not? How could one do anything else? In the end, it's I who need Doyle to remind me every day. How else can you live life than helping others if you can? Especially if you're a lawyer if you have the privilege, the privilege and the ability, the honor, to stand before justice for those in need. To stand at the bar of justice for those who need you. How else could you lead a life? Thank you. <laughs>